Good morning. Last few years, we have heard of great Christians, spiritual giants passing on. For example, in 2018, Billy Graham, one of the greatest evangelists, he passed on. But in the same year, he said this of his death. He says, I'm looking forward to death. I'm very happy to get out of this body and into the new world that has been prepared. It is a feeling of tremendous joy, relief, and rest. Then, this year, in May, we have another Christian giant who passed on. We have heard of him, Dr. Ravi Zachariah. And after he went through the last chemotherapy, he actually wrote this in reflection about death in the month of April, and in May, he passed on. He said this, that death is either a full stop or a comma. In the Christian worldview, it is a comma. There is for the Christian both the passing of all things and the abiding in Christ's provision. Now, these Christian giants began well and they ended well. But not all begin well and end well. Some of us may have heard of this Christian writer, Joshua Harris. At a very young age, at the age of 21, he had already published his best Christian selling book. And it's entitled, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. It is a book about purity in seeking a boy-girl relationship. And that book was so famous, it showed the Christian world big time. And after that, he went on at his young, young age of 21, 22, he went on to pastor a mega church, Covenant Life Church. And then, soon after that, he found, founded the Sovereign Grace Ministries. But then, at 2018, two years ago, at the age of 44, he divorced his wife and led the four children, and he renounced his Christian faith. And this is what he said. He said, by all the measures that I have for defining a Christian, I'm not a Christian. He wrote, and many people tell me that there are different ways to practice faith. I want to remain open to this, but he said this, but I'm not there now. So, Following this, there was a, another atheist actually wrote an article about Joshua Harris and he renamed or he, she named the article as I Kissed Christianity Goodbye, changing his best selling book title I Kissed Dating Goodbye to this. Well, not all begin well and end well like the previous two Christian giants. And in fact, many people began well and did not end well. And it seems that Joshua Harris' experience is very much like the Israelites' experience in what we have been reading from Exodus to Numbers, in the experience from Egypt all the way to the wilderness. In chapter 1 of the, the book of Numbers, that's what I've been preaching this year, they actually began very well. And someone in the church actually preached on this. It was a handsome preacher, I heard. Yeah. If you can't see the slide, the slide actually says this. That was a good beginning. You know, it, whatever God commanded, in the first two chapters, it was repeated and saying that they obeyed. They obeyed. And that's how the book of Numbers began. But sad to say, that's not how it continued. And... We've heard, we, we have read a long way from chapter 11 all the way to chapter 19. There were a lot of telltale signs of their disbelief. And what were the telltale signs of disbelief? The signs were their rebellions or their disobedience. These are the telltale signs of their disbelief. And of course we know at the climax of their rebellion was at chapter 13. They refused to enter into the promised land that God had promised them after they received the bad news from the spies. And the result of it, they had to wander 40 years in the wilderness. So, you see, they had a good beginning in the beginning of the book of Numbers. 
but that's not how they continue. In fact, in this chapter, we see that that's not how they have ended to. In chapter 20 of Numbers, it is the end of the 40 years of the wilderness wandering. Before we look into chapter 40, let us pray. Dear God, as we open up your word, we pray and we plead with your Holy Spirit that you will speak to us, not just informing us of knowledge, but speak to our hearts. We plead that your Spirit will speak to our hearts, that we may respond as good soil to your word. Protect our time together, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. How did chapter 40 begin? Chapter 40 begins at verse 1. It says that the first month at Kadesh, this is the map of Kadesh. This is somewhere here. They are probably around that area that is indicated in the arrow. And they were at Kadesh, and by verse 22, they move on to this place called Mount Hall, which they have to pass by Edom. You know, at least near Edom. You know, so at Mount Hall, and at verse 28 to 9, that's when Aaron died at verse at Mount Hall, indicated at verse 28 to 29. And how do we know that this is the 40th year, year, the end of the wilderness uh, wandering? Well, we can see that in the later chapter, chapter 33 and verse 38. And let me read for you. And Aaron the priest went up to Mount Hall at the command of the Lord and died there in the 40th year, year after people of Israel had come up of the land of Egypt on the first month, the first day of the fifth month. So this is the 40th year, year. At the fifth month, Aaron died at Mount Hall. And the first month was at verse 1. The first month, and which is the 40th year, year the chapter began as the death of Miriam, Moses' sister, and who was also a, was also a prophetess. This is how the chapter began. And how did the chapter end? It ended at the fifth month of the same year, Aaron died. And that's at verse 29. This is a depressing chapter. In fact, it is a depressing end for the 40 years of the wilderness, wilderness wandering. So I put here, not all who began well will end well. And therefore, we cannot take things for granted. And I see if the death of Miriam was not depressing enough, we see at verse 2 to verse 6, the next problem come at Moses and Aaron. And it's the same old problem. You see the complaint of lack of water and the people of Israel gathered against Moses and Aaron again. And it was the same argument. they rather die with the others in verse 3 and verse 4. And verse 5, it says, This place is a desolate place of wilderness. And there's no water here. It's like, like what the Chinese say, it's a place that Niao Pusantan. It's the same old problem in the wilderness. But what is the same old problem? Is it the problem of water? Well, you see that in Exodus chapter 16, they actually began the journey by complaining that the water was bitter and God graciously provided sweet water for them. And later at chapter 17 of Exodus, they complained that there was no water. And God again provided through Moses striking the rock. And the water was provided for the whole congregation. That's how the journey began. And now, that's how the journey ends at the 40th year. And the complaining was the same. But the real problem is not water. Why? Because God has again and again proven His power and His faithfulness to provide. So, what is the real problem? When I put here the real problem, it's the same old problem. It's a problem of the human heart, our own human heart. The heart of disbelief and hence leads to rebellion and disobedience. The heart of disbelief that finally leads to deep rebellion and disobedience. And this seems to be what is God trying 
to tell the readers of the book of Numbers. The situation may change. And in fact, they are at a different part of the journey, different part of the desert, far away from, from the previous situation. And time may change. They are over 40 years different between the first incident in Exodus 17 and now at Numbers 20. Situation change, time change, but the problem of the human heart remains. It is so depressing, and not just because the Israelites failed. The next portion, chapter, uh, verse 7 to verse 21, show us the two great leaders also failed. Take a look at verse 7 to 21, I, entitled The Fallen Heroes. You see, Moses is probably the greatest hero in this whole ep entire episode of Exodus. It means how they move out from Egypt all the way when they, they wander in the wilderness. In fact, DreamWorks Animation actually called Moses the Prince of Egypt. Great leader of faith, he led 2 million Israelites out of Egypt, out of the hands of Pharaoh, and performed mighty deeds, mighty miracles, 10 plates, opening the Red Sea, sending manna from above, opening the rocks and provide water for them, collecting the Ten Commandments. And Aaron, another great leader, he was a high priest, very important and significant role and duty that was assigned to him, specially anointed by God. We see that in Numbers chapter 17, that he has a rod that only his rod budded and the rest of them didn't. And he is the one who will stand before God on behalf of sinners, performing all the sacrifices, making atonements. But both these leaders failed God, and they were disqualified from entering the promised land. Take a look at the details at verse 8. God gave them the instruction, take the rod, Aaron's rod, that had budded, and gather an exam. Uh, the assembly of the Israelites and speak to the rock at to the rock at Kadesh. And what did both of them do? This command was given to both of them. And what did the both of them do? Well, verse 9 told us that they took the rock, which is correct. They gathered the people at verse 10, first part, which is correct. And they start speaking. But they did not speak to the rock. They were speaking to the people. And Verse 11 tells us that instead of speaking to the rock, they struck the rock twice. Well, they did God's work and yielded the desired result. Verse 11 tells us that waters actually came up and fed the congregation and the animals. But what was Moses and Aaron's failure? What was their failure? We ask ourselves. Well, verse 12 tells us disbelief. They did not believe God's word. God says, Do you not believe me? And resulted, they do things their way. Instead of speaking, they strike the rock twice. They began to believe that the mirrors, miracles is from them, not from God. For you see in verse 10, it says, Shall we bring out water for you, you rebels? Shall we become we? And they don't believe in God anymore. They begin to believe in themselves. And the result was disobedience. But we ask ourselves, why so serious? Well, Moses and Aaron were generally very faithful leaders, especially Moses. Why were they disqualified just for the one act? Well, you must understand that position and the appointment. First, Moses and Aaron. One was a prophet, Moses, and Aaron was a high priest. They had good knowledge of God's plan. How do we know that? Let me show you from the passage in the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 10 to 11 and Peter is talking about the salvation he said concerning this salvation the prophets he's referring to 
the Old Testament gospel writers and all those who are appointed as prophets, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, the New Testament believers, see, they searched and they inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when they predicted the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories. These prophets has the Spirit of Christ in them and they actually search and inquire carefully looking forward for things that they are doing now predicting the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories of Christ. So, they ought to know Moses and Aaron ought to know that this physical rock actually is a spiritual symbolism that refers to God or God's provision for a Messiah or which is in the New Testament called the Christ. They should know this symbolism. For example, they, they know that tabernacle and the holy articles in the tabernacle they are not holy in themselves. They will actually they actually symbolize God's presence with them which ultimately points to the ultimate presence of God with them in Christ when the word became flesh and dwell among them. All the offerings, for example, there were bull offerings, ram offering, lamb offering, high first blood. Although they know, they, all these prophets know that the blood of this animal cannot cleanse their sin. Only in God's final provision, the Lamb of God, only in God's final provision in the blood of Jesus Christ, in the death of Christ, can sin be atoned for. Likewise, over here, the rock is actually a spiritual symbol that God will provide the sustenance that they will live and not die. It's a spiritual symbolism that God one day will provide a spiritual rock that will provide the living water that the people who believe will not perish but have eternal life. And not just that, that was at the beginning, but now over here, that this living water will continue to sustain them in their journey whenever they need. Moses and Aaron ought to know this symbolism and the importance of this symbolism. Let me further explain this from the words of another passage in the New Testament to give us greater insights to this rock. It's in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 4. You see, our Father were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. So, the symbolism is this, that Jesus is the rock of their salvation. The rock symbolized a type of Christ. The rock gave water and they leave, and but the rock must be struck first. That is in Exodus chapter 17. So Christ must be struck. He must die to provide a living water so that those who believe in him will live and not die. Now, all that they have to do for now in Numbers 20 was to speak to the rock and not to strike it anymore because and the rock will still continue to provide water to sustain them so the similarity or analogy is this Christ died once and is sufficient he must be struck once only and he need, need not die again so all we need to do now is to ask him for that spiritual sustenance in time of need this is a very important symbolism and that is why it is so serious. And this is the kind of God that we have. And this is the kind of Saviour that we have in Jesus. He was the rock. He was the rock who was struck on our behalf. And He died on the cross to provide what we cannot provide for ourselves, the living water. That we may dream of it means that we may believe in Him and live and not perish. He is the rock of our salvation. But Jesus did not just 
leave us for the rest of the journey to fight for ourselves here on earth. He's still the rock that continues to provide what we need for life and service to Him. He, how? He gave us His Holy Spirit and the, who is, was described as from there the well of spring of living water will flow up from our life. Let me show you in John chapter 7 verse 37 to 39. Jesus said this, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And now, this is said about the Spirit whom those who believe in him were to receive. Now all that the believers have to do is to speak, to ask, to pray. And he will continue to lead and guide us through this Holy Spirit living in us. All we need in this journey here on earth to live a life of worship, to live as a witness for Him. He will help us and guide us by His Holy Spirit. And I put that Jesus is not just the rock of our salvation, but He is also the rock that follows us in the person of the Holy Spirit. In the person of the Holy Spirit. Moses and Aaron did not trust that symbolism of striking the rock once 40 years ago was sufficient. And all that they needed to do was to speak and you continue to provide. But they did not trust that. That's why at verse 12, the Lord said to them, You did not believe me. You believe in your own method. That's why Moses and Aaron said, Shall we bring water for you at verse 10? What were they doing? Well, in their disbelief, they not only result in, in them being rebellious towards God and disobedient towards God, they actually resulted in them stealing God's glory as well. They stole God's glory. What are some implications for us? You see, spiritual giants like Moses and Aaron, they can fall. So, first thing, never idolize any human leaders. No matter how spiritual they look or they have been. Never, spirit, never idolize any spiritual leaders. Number two, if these spiritual leaders like Moses, he can fail God and fall. We too can feel God and fall. And we see this, we see Moses further reliance on himself. In verse 14 to verse 21, he tried to cut across the territory, taking a shortcut through Edom to the place he wanted to go. So, this is Edom's territory. This was what he was trying to do cut across Edom. And he wrote a very diplomatic memo or a letter to the king of Edom. And this is the wisdom of, of, uh, of um, uh, Moses. First, it appealed based on relationship. In verse 14, he called the Edomites brothers. Because through a matter, they were cousin nations. Because their ancestors were twin brothers, Jacob and Esau. Esau, that's where Edomites come from. Jacob or Israel is where Israelites come from and they were twin brothers it is almost like today's um, situation like China and Taiwan they were probably like all the ancestors were traced to the Chinese uh, root you know it's almost like this a second thing he appealed to sympathy vote the vote of sympathy in verse 15 16 they say how much I suffer in Egypt you know and how much we've been ill-treated it is it came, what came to my mind is almost like you know, sometimes you watch those American Got Talent or those singing competition when the people uh, whether they can sing or they can't sing some of them play on this sympathy vote I'm going to sing this song it's dedicated to my dog who died 10 years ago and people start crying well, you know, American do love dogs right? And, and after that they will have a golden bar buzzer you know, something like this third he appealed to uh, to them as, as cost-free 
thing. It won't cost you a single thing. We will walk through, we will not walk, go to the field, we will not we will miss your vineyard, we will not even go to the well. It's cost free for you. It doesn't cost you anything. But he was rejected. And then he tried again. And with a more diplomatic term. Verse 19, it says, Whatever we dream, we will pay. Well, it is an attractive and handsome price, you must understand. It's a 2 million people with numerous cattle, you can imagine how much water would they need. And now he's offering a price that the king of Edomite cannot reject. And what's the result? They got rejected. In fact, verse 21, were they not just rejected, they were threatened. What's the problem with this whole issue? Well, the whole issue is that Moses did not consult God. In fact, God was not even mentioned Except at one part they say they cried, we cried out to God in Egypt. But that is exactly the case. Moses failed to cry out to God over this situation. He trusted his own diplomatic skills, his own methods, than dependence on God. This is really again a demonstration of his disbelief, like what he did earlier to strike the rock twice. And this chapter ended off the last part with a depressing ending, verse 23 to 29. It began, I said, I repeat again, it began with the death of Miriam, and it now ends with Aaron's death because of their disbelief and that leads to disobedience. This whole picture is like a summary picture of the whole entire first generation of the Israelites. Disbelief that leads to disobedience. It is like a sum of their 40 years journey in the wilderness. And their disbelief is seen in them trusting their own method, trusting their own wisdom, in this case Moses' diplomatic skills as well. And this is a very depressing ending and what they end up having to face God's justice against their rebellion. They began well. At the beginning of Numbers, first, few, first 10 chapters, they began well, but it didn't continue that way, and it didn't end that way. What are some implications for, for us? Well, first implication is that some of us, or maybe most of us even, may begin well. We may come from a Christian home with rich Christian heritage. Well, that's a good beginning. We attend Sunday schools, we grew up in a youth group, that is a great Christian heritage. Or maybe some of us came to know Christ at a later age, maybe teenager age or maybe university days. We were full of enthusiasm, we want to serve God, we want to share the gospel, we even go for mission trips. We have good beginning, but along the way, just along the way, we may get complacent. When we get complacent, what, how do we get complacent? Well, we get complacent by sometimes living on our past glories. Well, I was, I traveled to this place on mission, I preached to so many people, I've led this person to Christ. Oh, we live in our past, even spiritual glories. Or we live on our past knowledge. That's why I know about the Bible, and I think I know everything about the Bible. Oh, we didn't know how deep the word of God can be. Oh, we live on our past knowledge and it, it stay there. Or we live on our past experiences of how we, 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 we have camps and we enjoy camps and how we're enthusiastically serving God in this area, that area. I used to be that leader or involved in this other ministry. Well, we live on our past glories, past knowledge, past experiences. And we may not end well. We must be beware that we may not end well. And there are two ways that we may not end well. Number one, we may get stagnant in our Christian faith and we begin to dishonor the name of God. Just like Miriam, Moses in this chapter, and Aaron. Or, second way, we may shipwreck 
our faith, just like Joshua Harris. In the earlier example I gave you in, in the introduction, well, do not get me wrong, I'm not saying that Joshua Harris has no chance to come back to God. As long as he's not dead, as long as Jesus is not back, he still has a chance for repentance. But we do know, what we do know of Bible characters and in our history, church history, that there are net, there were many who actually shipwrecked their faith. Judas is carried is one of them. In First Timothy, there were a few who were mentioned, and these terms Paul used that like they shipwrecked their faith. So we do pray and hope that we'll all end like Billy Graham or Rabbi Zachariah, not in their achievement, but in that they were faithful to God to the end. But then some of us may begin to ask the question, how? How can I end well? How can I end well? I mean, this is a very sobering chapter. How can I end well? Well, let me suggest to you, this is how we can end well. Don't be complacent. A few years ago, I heard of this retired pastor. I heard from him as he shared on the stage. He was sharing at this stage of his life as a retired pastor. He said this, I have nothing to prove, nothing to lose, nothing to fear, and nothing to hide. That's actually very dangerous. And that's actually very, very complacent. Thinking that by that age, we have reached some kind of enlightenment stage or some kind of sainthood. But on the contrary, I heard of another pastor who is in his rightful retired age, John Piper, at the age of 73, which is last year, in an interview. And some of us know who John Piper is, a pastor of a mega church, written countless number of good Christian books, defended the Christian faith. And in the interview, he said this. He said he's as vulnerable to sin as he first believed. And he didn't think, now at this stage of 73, he didn't think that he's more immune to temptation than he was ever before. He was still on his toe. He's not taking things for granted. How can we do that? Oh, sorry. One, Wake up to your complacency. If you and me are still depending on our past experiences, living on our past spiritual successes and knowledge, we must recognize, recognize this, number one. The areas that we are prone to be complacent. And then repent. Say sorry to God. Tell God, God, I'm sorry. I'm living on these past things. I'm not moving on. And being complacent. Tell God that we are sorry. Repent of it. Number two. Work out. Work out a spiritual plan in these three areas. Spiritual plans in these three areas. One, word intake. How we continue to grow in our understanding of God's love for us through His word. Work out a plan for your devotion time. Work out a plan to attend IDG regularly, attend the sermon series regularly, pick up good Christian books to read, whatever it is. Work out a word intake plan for this year. Next, work out the word output. Work out a plan for a word output. Just not was a word input. Then we must work out a word output. And I put that a word output for one, one, one. One application for every in, one input that you take in to be done within one week. One, one, one. Whenever you hear an input of the word of God, work at one application. One is enough. That something that can be done within one week and don't delay further. 
some of us are working well on the work intake, but some of, many of us are very weak and poor at our work word output. We have an input, but we also must have output. Working out on the application. Lastly, work on our prayer life. Daily prayer. Not just personally. I hope you can also work as a communal prayer life. Pray with people in the church. Pray, come and join the prayer meeting. Work out your prayer life. Pray daily for your family, for your children, for your reality. Pray for your non-Christian colleagues and friends. Pray for the Christian, our church, brothers and sisters in Christ. Lastly, what can we do? Work on our spiritual areas. Two areas. Areas of weakness, it could be our laziness, Areas that we are ill disciplined at, areas we are giving ourselves over indulgence in, or work at an area of a sin. The sin of, you know, some areas of temptation that we will surely face late. Area of lust, or greed, or, or prone to gossip, or the use of our tongue, or prone to lie. Work on this area, work out, work out a plan. To work on this spiritual weakness or spiritual sin area. Do not be complacent. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this sober warning in these chapters of number 20 to warn us even by the examples of Moses, Aaron, Miriam, and the life of the Israelites. We pray that God. You will, by your power of Holy Spirit, wake that first love that is in our heart for you. That we want to continue to know your love and to love you back. And we will not want to be complacent. Help us, by your grace, to begin well, continue well, and to end well. Thank you for hearing us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.